to the third in the series of lectures on Michel Foucault's uh, Discipline and Punish, The Birth of the Prison. It's taken a bit more time to get through the book than I thought it would. Um, this lecture recording is entirely on uh, part two, punishment. Um, and so this is the era of, of what he calls, you know, the gentle, generalized punishment, the gentle way in punishment. This is the era of classical sort of enlightenment and, and uh, Protestant uh, Christian uh, reform uh, to sort of move modern, um, uh, you know, democratic so society away from torture and terror and into a, a more rational um, um, regime of, 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 uh, of penalty uh, that's more consistent with um, modern society. So I, I think what, what we should do then, let's just sort of review what, what this chapter is about. So, so the, the section that we're covering in this lecture then is entirely on um, this classical reform era, soul, right? The era or the, the position of soul, right? That soul reform is what we're looking at. So his argument is going to be that, that, that in the end, what, what, what we're covering in this uh, lecture doesn't stick. Um, it goes away. And that what we wind up with, say, by 1850, certainly, um, and, and even earlier in, in many parts of society, most sectors, uh, we wind up with prisons. So the movement from traditional um, torture and terror with the scaffold is sort of the visual a scene, the primal scene, the kind of stage set in which the drama of punishment is, is, is enacted, the scaffold is not replaced with what's called a punitive city, a kind of theater of rational, educative, almost a kind of schoolhouse, as he calls it, right? A school of, of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of illustrative um, just punishments, right? Um, a garden of punitive delights, as I like to, to think of it, right? A place where the public can see and uh, what he's going to call the representation of crime and punishment linked together, such that the, the notion of a crime, especially property crime, right, especially property crime, the notion of property crime is going to be linked immediately with the penalty one pays for committing uh, that crime. Therefore, the social body is going to not be um, terrorized, uh, by witnessing the torture of the condemned body on the scaffold and therefore bow down before the absolute power of the sovereign who's engaged in this sort of liturgy of torture and terror to um, make manifest the, um, the incredible uh, imperium or majesty or second body or power of the king, right? That kind of terrorism whereby one is awed, shocked and awed uh, by the um, dismemberment of the, um, of the body, that that is replaced instead with a view of punishment that is not scary, but rational, not frightening, but, um, but deterring, right? The goal is to generate deterrence, both to deter, deter the um, criminal from repeating the crime, again, especially property crime, especially property crime, and to uh, generate general deterrence in the population, not through fear, but through calculation, not through shock and awe, but through a kind of visible display of justice and of reasonableness and of, um, of legality, right, and of the penalty that's linked to illegality. So, you know, so, so his idea here that if the scaffold was the sort of built environment by which traditional torture and terror um, um, was displayed, the punitive city would be a kind of, again, a kind of theatrical scene, a primal scene that displays criminals publicly undergoing the penalty of having committed their crime. Again, not horrified, but... But again, uh, the, the population actually not trying to look away from the horror, but instead seeing the penalty linked to the crime. So that there's, again, the semiotic link. Every time one thinks of the crime and the pleasures of stealing or the pleasures of, of 
committing uh, you know, some other property crime in particular, the penalty that one must pay for committing that crime, which is more painful than the crime was pleasurable, right in Bentham's terms, in Beccaria's terms even, uh, that that is, con that is immediately called to mind, right? Okay, so the property crime, crimes against capital are shown to be more costly than uh, the pleasures uh, from having it. So uh, let's just sort of skip to this image here. So traditional monarchical law, again, it's the sovereign and the omnipotent power of the sovereign is displayed on the scaffold where torture of the condemned man's body or person's body takes place in front of spectators who are terrorized. And it is the terror of the subjects of the king witnessing this awesome power that generates power, that generates compliance, that generates, um, um, you know, power itself, right? So it is the mark of torture on the body of the condemned on the scaffold that is the materialization, the kind of um, the real presence uh, in, in a kind of Christian way, right? Like the, that the, um, that the, if the communion wafer post transubstantiation is the real presence of, of God, then the mark of torture on the condemned man or woman is the real presence of the omnipotent power of the king, right? So it's made manifest and then uh, one bows down before it, right? So again, the terror of having seen this power. And that is replaced uh, with this Protestant Enlightenment classical uh, reforms, right? Uh, uh, you know, do-gooding humanists, I guess is the way to put it, um, who, who aren't operating on behalf of a king, but instead are theorizing effective punishment, especially deterrence of crime uh, on, uh, among a civil society, a kind of contract contract-based capitalist civil society held together by, by law and, and justice, right? Juridical law. So again, the idea is not a scaffold, but a punitive theatrical city uh, that displays rational, efficient, um, um, uh, God, I can't even read, reasonable, the restoration of the soul through costly penalty, right? So you've done something against the social body and you're repaying uh, your debt to society, um, and you're doing it publicly, right? You're not behind closed doors or the wall of a prison, but you're actually uh, working uh, in public works out among uh, the population. So this creates, again, general deterrence by semiotically linking together the crime and the penalty. So it's all about signs, representations, codes, that kinds of things. So it's the sign of penalty, the penalty crime link, right? The link between crime and penalty, the real materialization, at least representation of the power to penalize, the power to, um, you know, to, to punish, again, uh, instills in the body politic a notion of justice, a notion of, of certainty, a notion of, of, um, of, of that, that, that the best, most efficient way to achieve one's ends in a modern state is to follow the law. And that violating the law isn't just painful, again, more, more costly to the criminal that the crime was, uh, um, you know, uh, beneficial. But uh, the wisdom and the, 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 the necessity for the legal order and the juridical order is made plain, right? So it's a kind of legitimation, ideological justification of the legal order itself, of the civil society itself by watching, um, visibly observing the penalty paid for crime, especially cr property crime. Again, this is a capitalist society here, okay? So, uh, so that's to move this being made from the scaffold into the punitive city, which never exists. It's never created. It's, it's, a, it's a utopia. Um, and uh, like many Enlightenment projects, it never, again, it only exists in some other place that we never arrive at. Um, and so, so this, this utopia isn't arrived at, but the, the political and intellectual project of the classical reformers helps to destabilize, um, the traditional world of the scaffold and the, the, the torture, uh, terror world, and then therefore creates a kind of, uh, indirect, uh, pathway into the prison, which does become, uh, the mechanism of power in the modern world, 
Okay, so is it so the reformers intended to create a kind of um, a cure of souls? We're going to operate on the soul. We're not going to we're not going to torture the body. We're instead going to reform the soul. It was meant to be humanistic. It was meant to return people to, to everyday life, to civil society. It was meant to be an end of punishment of the body. And instead, a focus upon, again, the, the restored soul, the possibility to restore a soul. And instead, that was the hope, but the unintended consequence was that uh, the path was paved into the prison. So again, like, like, like to use the words that Frederick Jameson used, the vanishing mediator, he uses that uh, in reference to um, uh, Max Weber's theory of the Protestant ethic. It doesn't become dominant. It just is a vanishing meteor. It walks onto the stage and provides a kind of temporary pathway led, allowing for historical change from um, here, <laughs> from the scaffold to the prison. There's no direct route. The only route is through something else, and that something else is the era of classical reform. Okay. Again, it's not clearly stated in that way, but I actually think that's the argument that Foucault makes. Okay, so again, like 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 the um, d again in our image of Damien from uh, 1757, the crucial thing, the body of the condemned person being ripped apart, makes manifest the real presence of the majesty of the king, and so the view that the thousands of spectators have of this dismemberment and the horror that one feels, the view of that, the spectacle of that terrorizes and again it's the way that the king's power is 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 again kind of clearly presented uh to um to the population okay so i'm going to make a i'm going to make a jump now that is going to become important as we move on um i'm going to make the claim that wherever uh you have punishment uh physical punishment in law that it's it's a mirror of physical punishment throughout the rest of society. That it, it, and Foucault is going to make this claim, right? That that the penal, the penal system or the punishment system, the legal order, is always sort of doubled in society itself. So here we have an, a very famous image of medieval peasants working and un, under the threat of the rod, right? So so you're, you're at work. You are subject to the same kind of physical punishment, pain torture, sometimes even the terrorism of watching one of your fellow workers be tortured as a mechanism to um, assert authority uh, in the workplace, right? This is um, traditional Siberian use of, of, um, of these rods, right? Um, in one of my favorite uh, uh, authors, Jerome Bloom, I've, I've used him uh, in, in a piece that I wrote on, on peasants. Um, Jerome Bloom's uh, uh, writes about Russian peasants in um, the 18th and 19th century uh, and how the um, power that the masters had over serfs increased greatly during this period. And that, um, I mean, I'm just going to try to look at some of this here. The, um, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of things in there about like, you know, sex trafficking, s uh, sexual assault over, over women's serfs. Um, trading serfs, selling them, and so on. But probably the, the section that's most interesting is the, um, is the section here on Russian serfdom, uh, that the power was, um, was unlimited officially. Officially it was limited so that, so that the master could not sentence his serf to more than 40 blows with the rod or 15 with a cudgel. Uh, nor could he imprison the serf for more than two months and so on. However, you couldn't enforce it because of what's called silent obedience. The serfs had no juridical standing that couldn't go before the law. In fact, it was actually illegal uh, for a serf to um, report uh, the master uh, to the magistrate. You could, so the serf would be punished if they did so. So, so you could actually kill um, uh, the serf. So so at any rate, very, very uh, brutal control over uh, serf lives, um, their sex lives, who they can marry, um, you know, lustful attack upon young uh, uh, women and so on, whippings, brutal whippings, sadism. Uh, there's a lot uh, talked about here. But the point is, you know, I, I don't want to really rehearse the full horrors uh, that, that, that Bloom makes, makes present here, but just to reassert that any account of pre-modern workplaces includes, and pre-modern families, tends to include 
um, accounts of physical punishment as the mechanism for uh, realizing authority, that the child knows that the parent has authority over them through physical punishment, and the worker, the serf, knows that the Lord has punishment over them uh, through the pain of the body. And again, it's the torture. Here we have the same thing. The spectators, uh, possibly fellow workers, um, fellow members of the commune, the peasant commune, watching one of their uh, fellow members being uh, beaten as a, a mechanism, again, of terrorizing uh, into obedience. Here's the, the, uh, the, the yeah, the nout, uh, uh, which is this, uh, uh, you know, whip with a big ball at the end of it. Um, so again, the beating of a serf for disobedience or being lazy, whatever it would be, um, again, and, and having your fellow um, villagers watching that is a way, again, it isn't just the torture of the body, of the condemned person who's being beaten, but it's the terrorism of the other villagers. Again, this is the realization of the power of the Lord or master over uh, the serf. And, um, uh, you know, here's another one with, uh, on, on, with again, from Siberia. Again, uh, rods against a woman uh, serf. Again, I already talked a little bit about, about Engels' writings about my, the mining proletariat. Um, this is from that 1832 uh, mining report um, that I talked about in one of the previous videos. But ag again, the physicality of beatings that go on, the physicality, the pain, and so on of the body as a mechanism to make real uh, the authority over um, uh, the person. You know, traditional schooling, um, uh, this is written about only a little by Foucault, he mostly writes about uh, schooling in, in reference to drilling and to this kind of um, uh, uh, disciplinary regime that emerges in schools. But underneath schooling um, are accounts of, of, of physical punishment as an important adjunct uh, to assert. This comes from a Prussian um, a source, but it's, it's it, again, it, it, the, the terrorism. So it isn't just a body of the student who's violated some rule getting beaten it's the view that all of the other students have the terror uh, that they experience vicariously from seeing this right is the real presence again of the authority of the schoolmaster over the child um even in the realm of religion in religion uh, uh the uh, so this is traditional ascetic practices of uh self-whipping self-beating so uh, one of the claims that Foucault points to, again, he's not full about this, he could be better about it, is, again, the, the, the notion that, uh, that the Protestant reformers are reworking society, are, think, are rethinking society, that the absolute differences between master and slave that was always part of, um, of, of traditional society is being, again, kind of lessened. And, 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 so, and so in traditional Catholicism and traditional... Um, 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 religion everywhere, you can wind up with a kind of reduplication of the authority relationship of the master over the servant or the master over the slave or the overseer over the uh, peasant or something. Um, you wind up reduplicating that in the self. So that religious practices of pain and torture and then the spectacle of the pain and torture experienced by the ascetic uh, penitent person, right? Um, as a mode of religious uh, practice. Again, kind of that ritual of pain and punishment, of torture and terror, that, that um, the liturgy of pain that Foucault attributes to the scaffold um, is duplicated here in the body of the, um, of the believer. And if you read any of the accounts of, of, um, of medieval saints, uh, medieval religious practices, you know, people who engage in all kinds of body mortification, uh, you know, wearing iron bands around parts of the body to squeeze it, to harm it, uh, wearing, you know, rough cloth next to skin, uh, not taking um, uh, care of the body, laying in cold, uh, laying on nails. There's all kinds of these ascetic practices. Again, a kind of liturgy of pain um, that is, again, uh, for the self as well as displayed uh, for others as a way to demonstrate the majesty of of God, who's imagined as kind of the ultimate Lord, right? I was raised Catholic. It always amazes me about the language of the Lord um, and even many of the kind of um, ritual um, 
displays of deference that one sees in uh, something like a Catholic Mass um, are, are the exact gestures, the, exa the exact language, the exact courtesies, the exact interaction rituals that would have been displayed in a traditional, um, you know, manner, a traditional uh, uh, surf village, right? That, 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 um, that display of deference is there. So the point is, when Foucault writes about these traditional modes of punishment in monarchical law, that isn't just confined to the legal system or the political system. It's a mode of, of authority and a mode of demonstration of authority, right? And of submission to authority that, that uh, sort of runs the gamut of social life. So the reformers, and again, the Protestant reformers are trying to undo that regime. Um, the Enlightenment um, uh, reformers are trying to undo that regime. And again, their focus tends to be here in Foucault's writing upon the prison and about doing away with pain and punishment and moving into a world of soul reform. But, but it, it's, it's transcendent, right? It transcends all the realms of life as we're going to sort of see today. So it's a complete reconstruction of life, a complete reconstruction of life to get rid of the, um, again, the, 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 the traditional torture, terror, scaffold, display, spectacle, liturgy of pain, and to move into something much more reasonable and rational, what they're going to call a punitive city. Okay. All right. So let's see if we can't kind of move into this. Uh, um, yeah. So the, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to use the book. We'll just use this as much as we can. Uh, so page 75 or so, so again, Enlightenment, Humanitarian, Protestant, Reformation, thinkers, and the, the, the concept here is generalized punishment. So the notion that, that Foucault has is that the spectacle is set up only when there is a torture uh, to be displayed. So, and, and not everyone gets tortured, you couldn't do it. So it, it becomes a kind of... Um, very, very explosive, very brutal, very vivid, but very irregular form of power. The traditional power of the scaffold isn't regularized. It doesn't, it, that there are all kinds of gaps and holes, places where some people can evade power, some places where other people are, where power is over condensed and so on. So it's not generalized throughout the social system, right? So, um, so the reformers are driven both by conscience and reason, page 75, uh, they're concerned with property crimes. This becomes really important. The defense of capitalism, the construction of wage labor proletariat, right? Uh, more than violent and capital crime. So this is going to go on kind of in the background of the chapter. There are moments where he cites Marx. There are moments where he clearly has a political economy um, approach, but he always tends to walk away from it. He never reduces his analysis to a kind of Marxist lens. And I think in a way that's a mistake because I think that, that the rise of capitalism explains much of the moves that are underway here, right? So uh, criminals are more than individuals, uh, or, or increasingly they're mere individuals rather than gangs. There's a division of labor. Um, yeah, the capital altered society. Uh, so terror and torture are no longer sufficient uh, for a variety of reasons. And they're looking for an efficient, effective punishment um, that excess power, excess torture, excess terror is wasteful. They seek to uh, end that kind of punishment uh, and that the, o oh, excuse me, the only proper end of punishment or purpose of punishment is the deterrence or the decrease of crime, not sort of uh, expiation or um, you know, the elimination of, of vengeance or something. So the only proper use of punishment is the reduction of crime, especially property crime. So page 80, again, traditional terror and torture was arbitrary and consistent. There were status privileges that, um, so that the justices that were in the system weren't trained. They were often, uh, you know, notables of some kind or aristocrats or something. Um, and so they, they, they weren't very rational in the way that they, uh, or, or, or um, systematic or um, uh, fair. Uh, they were often arbitrary, and so um, yeah. So they so they desired an economy of power and punishment that was regulated, controlled, coordinated. That was generalized. This is page eighty. So if you just think about again that kind of intermittent explosion of power that ripped criminals apart in the traditional world is to be replaced with a systematic kind of grid of law, policing, 
and penalty, right? So that um, so that the law and the um, enforcement of law, justice and and crime and so on, all get linked together in the public mind and help to generate a new capitalist society. Page eighty two, um, the reformers seek punishment as a regular function, coextensive with society itself. Um, punish better <laughs> to punish better more universally. Um, yeah, un, un, uh, as a necessity, right? And to place punishment deep into society so that law, regulation, routinization, and so on become a part of the social world itself. And again, much of this, page 93, is about capitalism. It's an expansion of illegalities of the lower order. There's all kinds of stuff in there about the elimination of the uh, commons and the kind of rights that the lower orders had in the commons in uh, a replacement of that with a um, uh, with a um, um, uh, yeah with with uh, with with a new form of illegality of property. So yeah, so it's all about laws against property become much more important than laws against uh, against uh, violence. So they sweep away feudal privileges that led to inequalities, uh, make law consistent with capitalism, accumulation, uh, and, and so on. So I'm supposed to read page 89 here. Um, okay. Yeah. So this is the new economy of punishment. So the goal was to shift the object and change the scale to find new tactics in order to reach a target that is now more uh, subtle, but also more widely spread in the social body. Find new techniques uh, for adjusting punishment to it, society itself, and adapting its effects. Lay down new principles for regularizing, refining, universalizing um, the art of punishing. Right, homogenize its application, reduce its costs. Right, and uh, and really, you know, push it way down into uh, the society itself by increasing its effectiveness, multiplying its circuits. Yeah, new technology of power to punish. So to make it routinized and constant and um, inescapable, basically, is what we're looking at. So page uh, 90, under capitalism and republicanism, the power to punish it becomes the defense of society instead of the defense of the um, or restoration of the honor or imperium of the king. Page 91, Beccaria, or Be Beccaria and the punishment of, um, of the ultimate crime. Yeah, so there's the imagination of an ultimate crime that would be the ultimate punishment from which other crimes would devolve. And, and in the end, that logic gets replaced with one of calculating um, the, um, the proper, um, the, so, that, so that the punishment of crime gets linked to the, to the pleasures of the crime. So that the penalty of crime simply becomes more, uh, more costly than the crime itself. So you're not thinking about crime in some broad way. It's really all about the calculation of benefit of the crime versus the cost of the penalty, that kind of uh, Benthamite uh, utilitarianism. So page 94, the rules of new classical reform, uh, the, uh, the general grid, yeah, generalized punishment. Uh, okay, so these are the rules. There's six. Uh, number one, there's the rule of minimum quantity. You don't want to use excessive force. You only use enough penalty as needed to deter um, the criminal from ever committing the act again and to deter any potential other criminal, everybody, from committing the crime, right, to show that the penalty is, is there. Number two, sufficient ideality. It's not the pain that actually deters. It's the idea of potential pain. So the idea was to represent punishment and penalty, um, you know, without uh, without actually having the corporal, uh, um, you know, realization of pain and terror in front of someone. The horror of that, you don't need it. What you need instead is a kind of representation of the likelihood of costly penalty that would deter you from ever engaging in the act itself. So once the act is completed, right, the crime is completed. Um, if no amount of pain is going to prevent the person from having committed that in the first place. So the idea here isn't just to bow down before the majesty of the king, but to avoid the specific crime because the penalty attached to it uh, is more costly than the pleasure that, and that the benefit that one would have gained from completing it. So number three, lateral effects. This is the focus upon, uh, upon general deterrence. So you're not worried just about the effect on the criminal, but the lateral effect upon the people who are um, who are who visibly see the penalty so for perfect certainty laws must be printed they must be certain they must be known they must be inexorable so that the punishment attached so so that so this is basically it 
that the only way that the legal order can hold together in a kind of contractual way in capitalism is for people to know the law. So the law needs to be more or less um, yes, gapless and seamless. It must be known, and the penalty for criminal violations must also be known, and the penalties must be greater than the benefit of committing the crime. And then you have to have this notion that it's going to be inexorable, right? that the punishment is going to be inexorable. That means you have to increase policing, increase surveillance, right? Uh, so that people are certain sure if they commit a crime, it's going to be punished. So that's perfect certainty. Number five, common truth. Uh, crimes must be reasonable, uh, scientific. The, the proof of, of crimes must be linked to the logic of everyday life. If you're moving away from a world of terror and torture at work, terror and torture in the family, terror and torture in schools, and moving into some other rational legal order, then uh, trials themselves have to become kind of scientific. New rules of evidence, new rules of procedure that use something like reason as the, and, and common sense, right, uh, as the basis for uh, making decisions about guilt and so on. And number six, optimal specification. Again, seamless, gapless, explicit code of law and criminal code for penalty, uh, coupled with flexibility in individualized sentences, right? that respond to extreme extenuating circumstances. So there's this specification, not just of law, uh, crime, and punishment, but also uh, an, an, a mechanism in place so that individual differences can be accounted for. Because if you're what you're trying to do is to work on the criminal instead of punishing the crime, if you're trying to reform them, then you have to be taking those extenuating circumstances in, into account. Page 101, quote Mabley, it is not the body, but the soul that is the target of punishment. Not the crime as such, but the criminal who must uh, be known. Again, this is the first moment of the knowledge of the criminal becomes important. And this theme now, that wherever we have pow power, we have knowledge. This is the first moment that emerges. Wherever we have power, we have knowledge. It isn't just a crime that matters. It's knowledge of the criminal, right? The criminal. It isn't just the act it's the actor, and to have some sense of their uh, uh, character, their personality, their history, and so on is important. And then page 102, the idea of crime and punishment it must be semiotically linked. So that becomes sort of the, 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 the way that he explains this, that, that the signified of a crime is the punishment. So that every time you think of the crime and the pleasures and the benefit one might have from committing that crime, you simultaneously, automatically think of the penalty associated with it. Now, this occurs because it's widely known. There's kind of optimal specification and it's, it's, it's spread throughout the population. But the way that the punishment is enacted keeps it visibly present in front of you, right? All right. So, so crucial to punishment, it, it has an educative function. It's enlightening. It teaches the population about the, um, the foolishness of pursuing crime because of the penalties associated with it. Okay. So the gentle way in punishment then is to work upon, this is, this is the next chapter, page 104. You're trying to work upon the soul of the offender. You're trying to work on the juridical subject. So everybody, including cr criminals, are part of society, right? They're part of civil society. Punishment is above all about representation of the crime and the punishment to the general population. So you're trying to restore the person back into civil society, and you're doing it by making the reasonable, rational, costly punishment penalty visible and attaching that to the crime itself. So they, there it is. You're trying to permanently attach the signified of punishment to the signifier of crime and illegality. So there's this new semiotics in the, of classical reform. Punishment follows the following rules. So number one, it's not arbitrary, right? Unarbitrary. Penalty is automatically attached to the desire for advantage. So the crime is viewed as an advantage, advantageous thing, especially property crime, and the soul's movement toward the crime is checked. So the, your, your desire to subvert the law by pursuing the direct object through crime is checked by your realization of the punishment, all right? So punishment fits the crime by negating the pleasure associated with it. You're trying to subvert the end. So there's a list on page 105, uh, the theater of punishments, and you actually can't quite understand what he's doing unless you get these, yeah. 
So his claim is, if we can just see this here. So you're trying to fit the punishment to the crime. Now, today we think of that in terms of lengthening the sentence, but that's not what he means. What he means is, is um, those who abuse public property will be try, deprived of their own property, right? Those who abuse the benefits of law and privileged public office are going to be deprived of civil rights. You gauge speculation and usury, you're going to pay fines. Theft is going to be punished by confiscation. Vainglory by humiliation, murder by death, fire racing by the stake. Poisoner, uh, you're going to present him with a goblet, the contents of which will be thrown into his face. Thus, he will be made to feel the horror of his crime by being offered an image of it. He will then be thrown into a cauldron of boiling water. Okay, a little bit still <laughs> pain and punishment here. But you get the idea is that you're trying to symbolically represent the crime through the punishment, right? And you're trying to negate it. So if your goal was to become rich, you you penalize the criminal, not just by taking away their ill-gotten gains, but by taking more, right? Um, yeah, so so yeah, if you're trying to gain a, a big reputation or something, then you try to take away infamy. Yeah, so there it is. So, so you're not trying to get vengeance or to create horror. You're trying instead to create is a theater of punishment, and that's on page um, 106, 106. An aesthetic, a new aesthetic of punishment. All right. Yeah. Yeah, the theater of punishment is here. Okay, number two. The aesthetics of punishment then reduces the attractiveness of the crime. So it's it becomes the pleasure of doing some crime becomes less pleasurable because the pain of punishment is immediately uh, called to mind. So he writes about this as a moral physics on page 106. There's a lot of references to capitalism. We're short on time. I won't read it, but there's this section on 106 um, that, uh, again, that kind of points to, um, yeah, capital as, um, yeah, the best way of punishing is to employ them. The argument is made here uh, through, through Mabley primarily that underneath most property crime is laziness. You're trying to avoid, you're trying to get, ill-gotten gains. You're trying to get things short circuit the work process by grabbing things you haven't earned. The best way to, uh, to solve that is to put them to work. So there's kind of a capitalist logic here. Laziness underlies all property crimes, okay? And then shame and humiliation are the way to negate pride. So anything that causes pride, shame and humiliation. Um, number three, temporal modulation. The length of the sentence should be optimized. Uh, not maximize, so that the anticipation of release is going to be crucial. Uh, otherwise, the, otherwise, one just uh, uh, abandons oneself to ultimate fate. So you have to have a release date in view, right? There has to be an end in view. And so you punish uh, uh, as, uh, yeah, so, so you're not trying to have lifetime punishment. And part of that is, is this notion that, that if you have lifetime punishment, you lock someone away um, and they can't be seen, that's a problem. If you kill someone with capital punishment, they can't be seen. That's a problem. What you want are people who are serving time in front of the public, uh, you know, receiving displeasure. So lifetime sentences are talked about, but um, but really what you need are people uh, uh, serving a certain sentence length, doing a certain task that symbolically negates the pleasure of the crime itself, humiliates and other things. So the potentially guilty in civil society must view the uh, representation in the sign of punishment. Uh, there's a discourse that occurs that you see this and you begin to think about it and we talk about it, you tell children about it. So, so um, yeah, there are no, yeah, you don't want spectacular useless penalties like ripping someone apart. Uh, instead, you want conspicuous penalty, conspicuous punishment, um, a, a, a that is widespread throughout the general population, and that's what's going to deter people from crime. So you don't want to just have these few moments of really extreme violence. Instead, you want a kind of routinized exposure of society to the laws and to the cost of violating the laws, right? So have prisoners labor publicly rather than ha on public works projects rather than have them work behind closed doors. And that's, again, the scheme of general uh, deterrence, the justice of laws, the justice of penalty. Again, so, so when you think about this, the capitalist logic is really there. If laziness is underneath property claims, according to a capitalist, make everyone work. If, um, if, if, if pride and being prideful of what you own is part of property crime, then humiliate uh, people by 
exposing them to the public. Well, so so publicity. It's not the shock and terror of the torch. This is point five, but the um, but the contemplation of sober, just punishment that deters crime. Okay, so you're not sh dropping into horror and terror because you're going to want to avoid thinking about it, right? You're going to go into avoidance. And you're not going to want to think about that terrorizing scene that you've seen. Instead, this is going to be part of. Um, you're going to, it's going to be titrated in a way that you're going to be able to think reasonably and rationally and that citizens will. And so that crime is going to be seen, again, as a, as a foolhardy way uh, to achieve ends. Uh, page 111. Punishment, then, is a school, not a spectacle, the garden of the laws, the garden of, of, of uh, punitive delights. Page 111. Um, what have I done with my book? There it is. Page 111. Um Yeah, so there it is. Uh, all this stuff about the legible lesson, um, you, you can read it yourself on 111. But um, yeah, a secret punishment is a punishment wasted, right? Children should be allowed to come to the places where the penalty is being carried out. There they will attend the classes in civics. Grown men will periodically relearn the laws. Let us conceive of places of punishments as a garden of the laws that families would visit on Sunday. Right, so you're learning the lesson, not being horrified by the result. Okay, all right. Number six, the love of laws then is what is being reinforced here, and the justice of laws, rather than the admiration for the criminal who has dared confront the you know you know because if you're up on the spectacle, you're the center of all eyes. If you're acting brave and so on, that there's all this glorification of the criminal. And so that will be replaced because the criminal is going to be brought low and be punished. And you're going to see that. And so that kind of creation of the kind of, um, you know, criminal anti-hero won't occur. And instead, the uh, affection of people will avoid the criminal and will go to the laws themselves. So this is what the punitive city then. It's a bunch of tiny theaters of punishment, uh, a city conceived of as little theaters of punishment. Morality lessons conspicuously displayed. That's on page 113. Um Picturesque punishments, page 114. You're not pu putting people away in prisons because there would be no semiotic effect if you did that, no educative function. Instead, uh, it's not, not representative of a specific crime penalty. So you need the semiotics. You need to, again, have people out and visible in the public. You have to signify the crimes they've created, maybe with an emblem or some other insignia, and then see them visibly uh, performing the penalty uh, as well. So 114, 115, why do we wind up then? Why doesn't this occur? So now, now Foucault asked the question, okay, why don't we have punitive cities? Why didn't this soul, this gentle way of punishment, this reform of souls become widespread? So why do we wind up with enclosed prisons as sites of punitive incarceration, right? Rather than the garden of punitive delights. Why didn't we go down that road? So the reformers helped negate the appeal of the torture terror system, right? Which was inconsistent with democracy and, and the rule of law. Okay, so they helped do that. But they were unable to create the garden of punitive delights, the punitive city, right? The theater of moral uh, schooling. So, uh, yeah, so to me, here's where he could have spent much more time on Marx and on Marx's capital. And to me, that is really the answer. He goes there in part, but often goes away from it again. So to me, the reason why we went to the prison is because that is consistent with capital and that the Civil society, in many ways, the civil society of, of autonomous subjects obedient to the law is not consistent with capital. It's consistent with bourgeois society, but we know that capitalism doesn't, isn't just composed of bourgeois society. It's composed of the wage labor proletariat. And um, to treat the wage labor proletariat as um, contract forming bourgeois members of a civil society is um, is inconsistent with the logic of capital. This is Creer, not not Foucault. What you need to do instead is throw people in prison because prisons then, as as he wrote about in um, Madison Civilization, that the that the the prison, the hospital, you know, the workhouse, and so on become uh, uh, essentially uh, the place where we fit young workers for the bit of wage labor. Okay, it's where we train people. 
uh, to give up larger dreams and larger hopes and to confine themselves to a lifetime of wage labor. So, uh, so again, he has that answer. It's there. It's just it's intermixed with other things. So I, I wish it was more fully drawn out. Uh, he talks about model prisons. So he claims one of the reasons that we don't get there is that there are these model prisons that become a kind of um, um, uh, they become almost celebrity institutions. Um, and so he talks about Amsterdam, um, you know, the model prison for young boys or young beggars in Amsterdam. It's really a workhouse as well as a prison. Uh, the, the crucial features, all of which are consistent with, with the capitalist wage labor system, work is mandatory. There's variable um, a sentence length that's tied to conduct and there's strict time discipline. It's all about forced work, coerced labor, and there's even the ability for workers to um, inside the, the system to accumulate, to be paid wages. And then the accumulated wages are given to the worker when they're released or for the prisoner when they're released. So this is entirely consistent with a uh, wage uh, labor in capitalist uh, factories. Now, my uh, professor uh, of, of, uh, of social control at the University of Kansas, Bill Staples, um, uh, really my first published article was co-authored with him about Foucault's uh, Discipline and Punish back in the early 90s. But he, uh, he's written extensively on surveillance from a Foucaultian standpoint. Uh, his first book was Castles of Our Conscience. It's a, it, you'll find the phrase in uh, Discipline and Punish. And, um, and Staples, uh, you know, to his credit, you know, recognizes that the, um, that the logic of capital is built into the logic of the prison, and it wasn't consistent with the logic of these um, soul reformatories, okay? So anyway, we get there in Foucault, but again, it's often, it flickers, it goes away. The English Quakers are then talked about. They added the concept of isolation, the practice of isolation to the workhouse, um, so they used individual cells. Again, their emphasis was really upon reforming, but that was also coupled, uh, yeah, that was consistent with Quaker theology really fast. The Quakers have a theology of inner light, the idea being that every born human um, is God's child and was born with the capacity to receive the inner light, to, be, uh, to get the white magic of, of God's presence. And that one has basically gone wrong, been around bad company, been in a bad environment, has become encumbered or burdened, traumatized in some way, and that that psychologically or materially prevents uh, the, um, the soul from experiencing union um, with God, right? Experiences the inner light. And so the so to the Quakers, their their entire world really is all about getting people quiet, quieting the soul, taking away burdens, right? Quieting even uh, the stirring of the flesh and so on, and in in order for people to experience the the mystical union with uh, with the inner light. So so isolation was important, uh, and this is what the Philadelphia model was all about. Um, uh, compulsory time discipline coupled with ceaseless surveillance and solitary confinement, the separate system. And really important, um, really important, um, Goffman's book Asylums is all about the underlife of total institutions like prisons, the Philadelphia model in particular. Foucault denies the existence of an underlife. When Foucault writes about any of these prisons and, and even these reformatories, they are total, right? And so he doesn't recognize the capacity for the inmates to develop an, un, uh, uh, an illicit, um, um, unauthorized life that allows them to, uh, uh, to escape the power knowledge network. He doesn't have that. So, uh, so this is really a weakness, I think, as he's writing about this. But at any rate, the prison then is, is a machine for altering minds, page 102. 125. It's a machine for reforming souls, for altering minds. All right, so then the key is that diagnosis determines the treatment. It is the offender that must be known by authorities to moderate and modulate, excuse me, modulate correction and rehabilitation. So they really become penitentiaries. More on that later, uh, right? A place of penance and and so it's really modulated. So you must know the offender. You must know the, uh, again, their experience, the traumas that they've had, what is encumbering them and um, and and uh, in order to 
see them progress through the system. So it's all about building hardworking, disciplined wage laborers under the cover of Protestant cure of souls. Okay. Now, I think the Quakers were sincere. And I think that the Philadelphia um, reformers, the Board of Governors and so on, I actually think that they were fairly sincere, that we're, that we're too cynical if we think that, um, that, uh, that there wasn't a kind of... Uh, I think these, these, these reformers really believed in this, at least some of them did. But later on, again, you, you get the, the, the reform of souls gets thrown away and the prison structure remains instead. And that's going to be where Foucault goes. So page 125, punishment prevents crime, transforms the criminal, um, correction of the soul. Prison is a machine to reform the soul, page 127, right? Uh, page 128 to 129, prisons gave up the conversion of the soul. So this is where... He argues that once the prison becomes established, um, and even once you get the first ones built, you quickly give up the difficult work of, of cure of souls. And instead, you focus in on coercion, that, these, that they, they aren't machines to reform the soul. They become machines to coerce the subject or the body and to get them obedient. So, so this hopeful enlightenment notion that we can reform uh, we can rehabilitate, we can return um, criminals, delinquents out back into civil society, um, restored, whole, um, um, gets abandoned, and instead a much, uh, in, in other words, take people in a capitalist society and make them fully functioning members of the bourgeois order. That's abandoned. And instead, again, I wish Foucault was cleaner about this. Instead, the prison is a place where we don't build members of the bourgeois. Instead, we build wage labor proletariats, right? So you give up the conversion of souls or the saving of souls and instead coerce the body, direct, enforced time discipline, right? Um, you reconstruct habits. You eliminate vices. You give up juridical subject of self-determination and autonomy. You give up that classical reform notion of a bourgeois subject and instead you get a docile obedient subject who follows orders and uh, has good work habits you get a, a wage labor proletariat so it's obedience to work authority not uh, someone who's subject to laws you want someone who seeks out and is effective within a factory wage labor structure instead of having someone who fully is autonomous and able to navigate the world uh, as as a member of bourgeois civil society so the punitive city of the spectacle and display uh, with general deterrence never occurs. It, 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 the prison was part of the mechanism to achieve it. As soon as it's built, you wind up giving up the cure of souls and instead it becomes this coercive institution. Again, to me, again, what Foucault, I just wish he was clear about it, that the Enlightenment reformers, the Protestant reformers thought they could build a kind of functioning um, uh, civil society. They didn't really have class analysis. They really thought they could uh, restore people into full participation as autonomous subjects in a bourgeois civil society. In the end, the prisons, uh, that was abandoned, and the prisons instead were used to create docile, obedient wage laborers who had good time discipline and who uh, could be exploited well within the capitalist order as a proletariat. Okay. All right. So that takes us then back to our general scheme. I think, I think we're done. Uh, see you in the next recording.